When do we first get a look at God's kind of love? How does this insight affect how we function as church? Why should that matter to me? These issues and more we will explore in this episode of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden. We're on episode number 19, Love from the Beginning. Welcome to Word Search, a place to search God's Word and a time for God's Word to search us, where we encourage godly character development that stimulates seeking God's kingdom first and His righteousness, because we believe that that should inform and transform our prayer and practice. For here at Word Search, we find treasure in God's Word so that we can be hearers and doers of that Word for His glory. On Word Search today, we will explore where we've been on God's Fit Body Plan, our series at the moment, and then we'll have our scripture readings. On that basis, we'll then explore love from the beginning, considering it first in creation and then in the Garden of Eden, before summing up with some concluding points for us to consider and some prayer points too. Once that's done, then we'll give you a hint as to what to expect next here on Word Search. Previously on Word Search, we're studying a series on God's fit body plan that's on the basis that every follower of Jesus should recognize that as a member of the body of Christ, they belong in genuine Christian fellowship. And also, God's body plan sees every member functioning as he wants them to so that the body can grow to maturity. Having completed our series looking at the five-fold ministry gifts, leadership gifts that Paul outlines in Ephesians chapter 4, last week we began to explore what is God's kind of love. And we looked at Ephesians and saw how Paul on two occasions underlines the crucial role that love plays in the building of the body of Christ. Paul also goes on to say that it's worthwhile investing our time to find out what that kind of love is, to know that kind of love that surpasses all knowledge. And what we uncovered last week was that, according to John, that kind of love is perfect. What we also went on to conclude was how Paul's desire is for us to grow in knowing this love and how God displays his nature in Jesus Christ. And so we are now going to embark on a series of finding out more about what God's kind of love is all about. To help us with that, let's go to our base scripture reading taken from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 19 and chapter 4 verses 15 to 16. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 19 says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 4 verses 15 to 16 tells us, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Holy Father, righteous God, in the name of your beautiful Son, Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to search your word. 
Open our hearts and our minds at this time so that we can recognize how your love has been displayed even from the start of the world. Help our eyes to be opened and our hearts to be receptive to what your word has to teach us so that we won't just be hearers of your word, but we can find out how your love makes a difference to how we should love. Help us now as we look to you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Love from the beginning. The beginning as we understand it from our perspective is creation. So I want us to consider where can we see God's kind of love in creation? When you look at Genesis 1, it's such a masterful poetic description of creation itself. And there's something in there that gives us hints as to what God's kind of love is like. Take what it says in day three, for example. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds and tree bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. What's fascinating about this scripture is how God, from the start, has this wonderful idea that part of creation is to ensure that there are not just trees, but trees with fruit, and not just trees with fruit, but in the fruit are seeds that will allow there to be trees that bring up fruit, that in them have the seeds, and so on and so forth. That is to say, God's great creation idea has it in mind that there should be fruitfulness that replenishes and goes on to fill the earth. But it's not just in the trees. Notice what it goes on to say in day five. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. Creation then. God's kind of love has within it that explosive multiplying nature. That it's not just a static one of its kind, but it's supposed to reproduce and keep on reproducing to express this dynamic life of God that is never still, that's never stagnant, that's always living, ever living. Notice what he says about the culmination of creation. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In our last episode, we saw that God is love and everyone that loves is born of God. And they're born of God because they reflect the image of God. And here we have God laying out how At the culmination, at the peak of his creation, he creates mankind in his image. Mankind is there to be image bearers, to reflect who he is. And so from the start, we get to see God's kind of love that man is supposed to be expressing and reflecting. What do I mean by that? You'll find out a bit more uh, later on. But already from here, that kind of love is seen in creative love, producing love, making love establishing kind of love that can rule and have dominion 
and bring out the best in creation, even as God, when he made creation, saw that everything was good because what he made, what he established, what he put together was good so that every component part, as it functioned as it should, made a very good creation. That indeed was God's reflection when he saw every component of creation functioning as it should. It was an active and dynamic engagement in his creation and it underlines the kind of love that he operates by. One that is active, dynamic and wants to see every component working together to express the goodness with which it's created. That's also why the body of Christ is supposed to see every part functioning as it should so that the body as a whole grows to its maturity in fulfilling who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Genesis 1 gives us a big picture view of creation, but I want us to see God's kind of love even further when we look at Genesis chapter 2. And in particular, even still in the creation part and before the garden, notice the description that's given about the making of man. And I want you to see love in creation even in the making of man. As Genesis 2 says, The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So whereas we have the big picture view in Genesis chapter 1 of God speaking and things responding to his voice, here in Genesis chapter 2 we have an even more intimate picture. So we're given the picture of from the dust God formed, God shaped, God made. Now he would do this with the animals and the birds likewise. So we have this whole issue of there's from the dust and he shapes and he forms rather like a potter. But then from there, what God does is he breathes into man something that's very intimate, something that's very close. He breathes into man, into the nostrils, the very life that man requires to function and to exist. And all of a sudden, that which had been crafted and shaped is now animated to become a living being. So God's love is very intimate, it's very close at hand, it's very tactile. It's not distant, it's not hidden. This kind of love is involved, this kind of love is up close and personal, this kind of love wants to give life. Uh, and this is what we see in, in creation, even in Genesis chapter 2. That's a glorious picture of love in creation. But how about love in the garden itself? As if things weren't intimate enough in terms of how God made man, we are given the depiction in Genesis chapter 2 further in terms of how God would put man in the garden, give man work to do. Also notice what God observes uh, right as man is in the garden in Genesis chapter 2. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed one of the first pictures that you can consider when you think about love is the picture of a man and a wife getting married and the story behind that, as Genesis will allow us to know, is about a God who loves his creation and recognises that for creation to truly be all that he wants it to be, man is not good on his own. 
and the male's capacity for a relationship to truly be fruitful, to fulfill all that God has commanded them to do in terms of being fruitful and multiplying and having dominion, that male can only do that with a female. And this scripture underlines that clearly. Now, it's wonderful to see man's response to what God has done. But we're here to see God's kind of love. I want you to notice in this episode, first of all, how God's kind of love provides. God sees the issue beforehand and he knows that he will go on to address it. He says himself, I will make him a helper fit for him. What's fascinating about that as well is that God's kind of love looks to complement things. He doesn't want the same, but he wants things to complement each other. And by complement, I'm not saying you say something nice about the other person. I genuinely mean that they work together so that they can bring about the wholeness and perfection that God is looking for. Again, we consider the body of Christ. And Paul in Ephesians will go on to outline how the body of Christ is rather like Jesus and his bride, the church. In the sense that Jesus will do anything to ensure that his bride is as adorned and as beautiful and as spotless as she should be in preparation for the consummation of their relationship. Because there's a love thing going on. And it's this kind of love that looks to complement each other, ensure that there are two factors together. Then there's this word, it's a simple word, and it's the word made. You would say, yeah, but Christopher, you've been talking about creation all the time. God made everything. I hear you. But here in this specific example, I want us to get the idea of not just God as a maker in the general sense, but the specific care and attention that God gives to ensure that the male has a helper suitable for him, that fits him, that can come alongside him. What does that say about your God? that he would not just make, but he would fashion and shape and form, that this word made gives us the impression of God being a manufacturer that builds to specification that which is fit for the male. Look at that kind of love, an active love, a dynamic love, a creative love, um, a love that makes and builds. It's not a love of sentiment. It's not a love of just the word. It's a love of the word in action. And then when we consider carefully what what that love is building, that love is building unity. And it recognizes that unity can only come about when two become one. So we have that picture that the man will leave his father and mother and hold fast, cleave, attach himself to his wife. And then the two become one flesh. And that image of unity that produces fruit. A unity of complementing factors is an expression of God's kind of love, that there are differences between the two, but those differences are not for division, but they're actually made to complement each other, to bring about a unity that can produce fruit, so that the two that becomes one can be fruitful and multiply and replenish and have dominion over God's creation because of God's kind of love reflecting him that relational love shouldn't be a surprise because as we noted in Genesis 1 when God said let us make man there's a hint there of a relationship going on in our image uh, an image that is clearly relational that has complementing forces working together for unity it says then something about the kind of love that God wants his church to express. That kind of love that is active. That kind of love that is dynamic. That kind of love that looks to provide for one another where we see needs that need to be met. In the same way that we are made in his image so that we can express his love for one another. We can see that first and foremost in how a man loves a woman in that given institution of marriage. How that love between the man and the woman sets and establishes the framework by which everyone else can know what real love looks like. So as God is integral in bringing about this unity, so we understand that all marriages can truly flourish when God brings about that unity between them so that his kind of love can be the benchmark and the hallmark for how those two can become one, complementing each other, 
with that providing, making kind of love. There is also a crucial part of the garden experience that we also have to consider in terms of what happens in Genesis chapter 3 and how man disobeys God, rebels against God, um, starts the whole syndrome of sin that has affected humanity ever since. And even in that, we can see God's kind of love in action. Notice, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God says, I will put enmity between you, that's the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So even in this scenario, God's kind of love is not defeated by disobedience. God's kind of love will do what it takes to defeat the enemy, to do what it takes to restore right relationships by attacking the source of division, attacking the source of disunity, attacking the source that's brought in such sin and death and despair. God makes that promise even then as a forerunner to what will happen when his son is revealed and how he will express the kind of love that we were looking at last week in terms of God's great expression of his perfect love in giving his son so that through him we might live and he would be the propitiation of our sins. Notice carefully as well how God will go on to cover the needs of fallen humanity. So in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 when he says, The Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Adam and his wife hid from God and thought that they could cover themselves up. But God, even in the light of their rebellion and their turning their back on him, still chose to cover them up properly. I spoke with my friend Shirley Evans and she covered the situation so well by making these comments. Even though man had rebelled and disobeyed him, he went and covered their nakedness. He didn't have to do that. It's just get, put a, you know, get yourselves out of here. Go and sort it out yourselves. But he covered their nakedness. He covered them. And that's what God, that's what love does. It covers you. Yeah, love covers. It doesn't leave you hanging out there ashamed and naked and bruised. It covers you. And that's God's kind of love. I think so. As well as that, then, there's another aspect of love that is fascinating that we don't always necessarily appreciate. But look at what God says in verses 22 to 24 of the same chapter 3. God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever... Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. On the surface, that doesn't look like an act of love, but consider these thoughts from Shirley. If you think about it, man had fallen and now sin was a reality. If you look at how life is going now, every day there's more evil and, I don't know, more ungodliness, more rebellion. If we were to live in a perpetual state with the tree of life forever with that condition, that would be, that would be awful. It would be awful. But a loving God determined that he should fix, give a fixed point to our days and create something better where there would be no evil and where we could live in harmony and there would be no rebellion so even the act of what looked to be an unkind thing in terms of being kicked out of your home was an was a great act of love it was I mean, he, he helped he helped us he delivered us from ourselves can you imagine stuff that's going on in this life that was to go on forever in, you know with, with no with no end in sight oh my gosh that'd be awful notice then this kind of love that safeguards that protects and that aspect of the cherubim being there to guard every way access to that tree of life it's not to say that nobody can get to the tree of life 
It's just to say that to gain access to the tree of life, we need to do what's right in God's sight. And God, even as we said at the beginning of this element of how God communicated hope and restoration and reconciliation, God would indeed bring about that return to the tree of life through his son, Jesus Christ. But that kind of love then tells us that we have a responsibility ourselves in our relationships to safeguard life, protect life, treasure that which is valuable to God as an expression of God's kind of love. Not everything and anything goes. It's really crucial that we have that same protective nature that we can have likewise if we appreciate what God is doing as we look to him and understand more of what his type of love is like. Here are some brief notes that I want us to consider carefully. Uh, first of all, we should see that God's love is clearly on display in creation. The life-giving and the life-perpetuating nature of creation is an expression of his love. We should also see that God's kind of love is not just word, but it's word in action. It's word that acts, it's word that provides, it's word that cares for. And then we can also see how this love is a up close and personal, intimate kind of love. It's not distant and it's not hiding and it's not putting a barrier between us. It wants to come up close, even as God did when he created man in his own image and breathed into him the breath of life. God's kind of love also acts to restore, to cover, and to reconcile. We can see that this is God's kind of love even when man rebelled against God. He never gave up hope on mankind. We should also see, as has been expressed throughout this session, that Jesus himself expresses this kind of love throughout his ministry. We can see Jesus doing that, for example, in his interactions with different people when he would restore them, he would love them, he would touch the lepers, he would talk to women who were supposed to be on the outcast of society, he would bring them in and allow them to see that this kind of love restores and reconciles, as well as this kind of love wants to make right what's gone wrong, as Jesus shows in his ultimate act of sacrificing his life so that we could have a right to the tree of life. So our challenge as ever remains, what can we do to explore this kind of love and then to express this kind of love to others? In the light of what we've looked at, here are some prayer points that I want us to consider. We have reason to praise God for his creative love. When you look at the world around you, when you look at the sky, when you look at the birds, when you look at the fish in the sea, when you look at the animals, when you look at the grass, when you look at the trees that produce fruit, and when we look in the eyes of others made in his image, we have reason to praise God for his creative love. We should also be able to thank God for the love that covers, not the love that exposes, not a love that is fickle and will disregard us. No, this love covers and looks to restore. We should thank God for that kind of love. Let's go on to ask God for the wisdom and the strength to be able to express this kind of love to others as we receive it. The whole point is that we receive it, we know it, to live it. Then let's go on to seek God for opportunities to appreciate this kind of love. Sometimes we're so busy here and there doing this and that, that we don't really stop to appreciate and say thank you and to praise him and to acknowledge that he has truly loved us in, in this way. So let's take those moments out and seek God for that time to appreciate his kind of love. Then finally, let's celebrate God that he will establish a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will rule. So in, in as much as man's rebellion has endeavored to ruin creation, God has promised a restoration of all things with the new heavens and the new earth. We get to experience his love now with the promise of a greater reality to come as he establishes a brand new heaven and a brand new earth where righteousness will dwell.
Next time on Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, we'll go on to episode number 20, Love You Can Rely On. Please join us for that, where you can find out a bit more about the faithful love of God. In the meantime, remember to like this video, share it with your loved ones, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And remember to turn that notification bell on so that you can be updated on future episodes of Word Search. Word Search is a production of Zion Awake Ministries. Please consider supporting Zam however you can by getting in touch with us in the details in the description. Thank you so much for investing your time here on Word Search at this time. Uh, we hope it has been a blessing to you because here at Word Search, we want to find treasure in God's Word so that we can be hearers and doers of that Word for His name's sake. Until next time, God richly bless you and those that you care about as you embrace His kind of love. Shalom.